to what they say. They don't care about your life anyway. Put us to shit tomorrow, scared of being slaves. They took our true identity away. Tell me, do you know who you are? You know, you have the bloodline of kings. Like my king, shining bright like the stars. You are his pride. Let me tell you a little about your history. Since our family tree became a mystery. Some people can only trace it to their great 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 grandparents, which only started this place. But what about before we came to America? Before the boats and the chains was impairing us, right? Before Africa, when we was in our land, speaking the language as a people we can understand. See, they really never tell us that we need bro, because the blood of the Messiah in our people. They got the world thinking it's them, though they fake Jews. The Ashkenazis in our land, they full of hate too. The Shua said it's the best. I listen like a child. Jerusalem should be trotting down by the chin child. I heard it clear, and I know that it shots will Because the prophecy you spoke had to be fulfilled Don't pay attention to what they say They don't care about your life anyway But it's the shit tomorrow, it's here to be slaves They took our true identity away Tell me, do you know who you are? You know, you have the bloodline of kings Like I'm a king, shining bright like the stars Yes, yes. Welcome back. It's another episode of God's Glory and His Story. I'm your host, MC Enemy. It's spelled I-N-A-M-E. It's not about me. It's about the Word of God and His truth on His channel. Don't forget the prayer of Paul to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 21. Read it. It will bless you with understanding of God's love and His Word. Don't forget the cap for Christ at 12.34 a.m. and p.m. It's all about speaking with one voice, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, you read the rest, but it will bless you. All right, it is written. I like that. It's kind of powerful when you say that because you, you're referencing the word. It is written, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Well, that's that's my excuse for this episode because it's kind of it was kind of out of order. This episode is the continuation of last week's episode. Niger, please. I felt like I missed an opportunity there to tie it together. And I believe it's all, nothing was by coincidence. It's all by God's design. So I am going to do this part, which actually should have been first. And the one that you saw last week should have been this week. All right, so here is a map of the Niger River. You can see um, its source, well, you can't see the source, but I'm telling you the source is in the highlands of Guinea. Guinea. It flows northward up to Timbuktu, and then it makes a sharp right, starts coming back down, and empties out um, into the Gulf of Guinea. And I think that's in Nigeria. So the Niger River or Niger River is the most important river in West Africa. It is the third longest river in Africa after the Nile and the Congo River. Known for its distinctive boomerang shape, the Niger River flows from the Guinea Highlands to the Sahara before making a sharp turn back to the Gulf of Guinea in the Atlantic Ocean. Given the river's history, historical importance to trade and agriculture in the region, the Niger River has been at the heart of the most renowned civilizations in West Africa, such as the Mali Empire. So here's that Niger River again, Niger River. And I stated last week that, you know, that is part we're gonna examine the N-word and its origins. Well, 
this Niger River was where many of our people congregated. We lived in and all around the Niger River Basin. So we were known as Nigers. Now, if you use a Latin tongue, using those same letters, the I has the E sound and the E has an A sound. So it would be Nigars. Hmm. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? So here is all the place. We saw this map last week that Niger River Basin is off on the, towards the left side, but then we also migrated down into the, the pink areas. And I happened to do one of those DNA tests to, uh, from AfricanAncestry.com, highly recommend it because it doesn't just tell you what you already know that you are descended from West Africa, but it also tells you whose DNA genetic material you share, uh, which tribe you share generic DNA material with. So my people happen to be right there at that bend. Uh, I'm talking about my paternal ancestry is the Fong people. The G is actually silent, silent as far as I know. And that area is right there in the area of Gabon and uh, Southern Cameroon. It's where my paternal ancestry takes me to. So last week we talked about the migration of our people. We said that one branch went west of Egypt on their way to Arsarith, which is in present day Algeria. And one branch went south to Elephantine, which is in present day South Egypt, near Sudan. And I have in parentheses, Sudan is actually another one of those words that's been smashed together and made up a new word. It was, it was actually so Udan. The so means foreigner, and the Udan is one of the uh, deviations of the word Judah. You can look it up in, Scr in Strong's Concordance and they will tell you if you put in Udan, one of the variations of that word comes out as Judah. So Sudan means foreigner of Judah. And you can see I got one of a uh, picture of somebody down there playing three card Monty because that's one of the devil's tactics. He just changed, keeps switching the cards round and round and go, pick the card, but they keep changing the names on us because they want us not to know who we are. So here is present day Africa. So you can see Egypt, you can see Sudan right there beneath it. So that's where one of the branches went through. You can see Algeria out there on the northern part. One of the branches went that way up towards Arsarith. Way back in my first episode, I talked about this, this um, map from a French uh, geographer, Herman Maul. And you can see on the map, they had Negro land and beneath Negro land, they have Guinea. And they have Guinea sliced up. And you can see clearly it says Grain Coast, Gold Coast. Right next to that is the Slave Coast. They were looking for a particular people. It wasn't just anybody they were looking for. If you look at other maps in that area, some of the maps show kingdom of Judah. And we know that Judah is the head tribe. And what's the easiest way to kill a body is to sever the head. So here's another look at that Niger River Basin. So now you can see it pretty clearly starting in Guinea, going all the way up through to 
Molly in Timbuktu, making that, that boomerang shape, coming back down through Nigeria and out into the, the Gulf of Guinea on the Atlantic Ocean or in the Atlantic Ocean, right there in the bend of Africa. So now let's examine how our name evolved from Hebrews, which is the language that we spoke, became Israelites, descendants of Israel, which is Jacob. We became known as Yahudim, God's people, became known as Yehudi. I don't have that written there, but Yehudi is just a short version of Yahudim, and it's singular. So from Yahudi, you, you become uh, Yahoo's plural or Yahoo. And when, then when you go into Latin, that same word Yahoo would be written I-E-W. And I told you those Latin languages, the I has the, the E sound because they don't have a corresponding Y. So they take an I and an E and they get E I. And the W is actually two U's together. E I U's. That's how they got E I U's. And when you go translate that into English, the letter J gets introduced, the J takes the place of the I and it becomes Jews. That's an etymology lesson. Look it up. So Psalms 82, excuse me, Psalms 83, two through eight takes place at this time. You know, the uh, Europe outlaws Judaism, uh, the Muslim world outlaws Judaism, and it's just a fulfillment of prophecy in Psalms 83, um, verses two through eight. And I'll just read it to you. And I'm us using the New Living Translation version. And it reads, don't you hear the uproar of your enemies? And this is David talking. David is writing this letter or this, this Psalm. Don't you hear the uproar of your enemies? Don't you see that your arrogant enemies are rising up? They devise craft, crafty schemes against your people. They conspire against your precious ones. Come, they say, let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We will destroy the very memory of its existence. Yes, this was their unanimous decision. They signed the treaty as allies against you, the Edomites, Ishmaelites, Moabites, Hagrites, Gebelites, Ammonites, Amalekites, and people from Philistia and Tyre. Assyria has joined them too and is allied with the descendants of Lot. Very clear. Basically, everybody was against us. Kind of like Joseph getting that multicolored coat and his brothers turning against him. See, Joseph uh, was favored by his father and the other brothers, our ancestors didn't like that. So we st we're still not done yet. We still had more name changes that we went through. We only went through a few of them. So we also went through being called conversos in Spain, in Portugal. Then they also called us Negro, because that's the Spanish and Portuguese word for black. And we came uh, Nigers or Nigers, because that's the area of Africa that we coalesced around that Niger River Basin for the most part. And I already told you, if you use a Latin tongue, it becomes Nigars. We know what that sounds very close to. So we, we, it becomes that N word. And even that N word in South Africa, when South Africa colonized, was colonized by the British, they called us Kaffirs. 
but it still meant the same thing. It meant that same N word that is used in the United States. These are examples of, of biblical things called bywords. They have dual meaning, slanderous meanings to them, negative connotations. Deuteronomy 2837. I'm using the 1611 King James Bible. Verse 37 it says, and thou shalt become an astonishment, a, prior, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. Prophesied. They're in the Bible, they prophesied, they have to happen. So then we became black. Here in America, they change it to African American to make it sound more uh, politically correct. But if you've heard me on this channel on other versions or other episodes, you know I prefer the term swarthy, which means dark skinned. There's different shades of dark skin, or you can call be called melanated. I can get with that. That's not a problem there's different levels of melanin in your skin but better yet how about you just call me what i am an israelite a descendant of israel the man also known as jacob I'm not going to watch the video it was just a video of the uh, someone showing you how that three card Monty um, scheme is carried out. Maybe I'll put a link of it in the description box, but it basically shows how the shell game is played or the, the card game is played with sleight of hand. And, and that's exactly what happened to us. They build up another people to, to be called Jews right alongside of us. And then they take us out, leaving them as the, biblical Jews, but they do not have the lineage or the uh, heritage or they're not descendants of Jacob, who is also known as Israel. They keep changing your name till you lose track. So I have to use that line from coming to America again. I've used it before, but it fits. Father Yah called him Israel. I'm going to call him Israel. That makes us sons of Israel or Israelites. So some of our Israelite family are saying we should not be voting. They say that we are putting someone else above us. Now that, that may be true if you were in your land, in, in our own land, because you know our ancestors wanted a, a king. So God allowed us to have Saul as our first king, but he wasn't happy about that because he wanted us to accept him as our king. But we're not in our land anymore. So the question becomes, should we be, should we vote in the upcoming elections. Yes, Niger. Too many of our people shed blood and sweat and tears for the right to vote. Get your behind up there and cast your vote. We're not in our land. We're in the land of our, uh, in our captivity. It's not physical captivity right now, but it's, it's still a lot of us are in mental chains. A lot of us still don't know who we are. So with all due love and respect, you would be correct if we were in our own land. We should not be putting others ahead of us or in charge of us. Others outside the, the uh, family of the Israelites. But like I said, we're in, in our, the land of our captivity.
if you read the New Living Translation, Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and it reads, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. So submit yourself to the government and its officers. Even Christ said when he walked this earth, give what is to uh, Caesar to Caesar, give what is to the Lord to the Lord. So casting lots is a, is, that's a term, a biblical term, casting lots, or what we would say in today's language would be rolling dice to settle a matter. And, and it is a well-established biblical principle of them casting lots. Just do a search in your Bible on your phone, put in the search cast lots, and you'll see that phrase appears in about 18 different places in the 1611 King James Bible version. So even if you're casting lots, there's still an element that is left to the most high because he still controls the outcome of that, that casting of the lots. You think you have control over it. You think you might be good at it, but it still has the element where the most high has the final say. So what else do you cast? We're not casting lots now. We cast our ballot. So get out there and vote. It's a biblical principle. So next question that comes up, should slaves obey their masters? They used to use that all the way, all the way back in those days when we were in chains and in the fields, picking cotton and doing other things that they had us do agriculture wise. And they taught, they taught us or brainwashed us into believing that slaves should obey their masters. They would read the Bible to us because we were not supposed to be reading. And this was their version, right? Niger, please, come on. I'm gonna look at a couple of different versions and you'll see, you tell me which one is the correct version. So here's the New Living Translation and you guys know I like the New Living Translation because it's easy to understand. But as I told you before, I don't always rely on, I do not rely on one version. It takes two or three to establish a fact. Another biblical principle. So let's look at First Peter, verse two, excuse me, chapter two, verse 18. New Living Translation, it reads, you who are slaves must submit to your master with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and, and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. So that is the New Living Translation version. But let's look at the King James Version, the 1611 King James Version. Remember, the older the text, the closer it is to when it was written, the better it's going to be, the less hands it's gone through, the more true it's going to be to the original writings. So the 1611 King James Bible, that same verse, 1 Peter 2.18, it reads, Servants. Be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. It says servants, does not say slaves. Some of you guys might say, well, that's a difference without a distinction. Not so. Let's look, look at the word froward. That's not something that we normally use, right? So froward means moving or facing away from something or someone. But if you move, look at the second verse version of it down below, the second um, definition, it's also meant, means 
difficult to deal with, perverse. So I'm just gonna back up. So it says not only to do the good, to the good and gentle, but also to those who are basically difficult. But it says servants, be subject to your masters. A slave is a servant, but a servant is not necessarily a slave. Two different words. Our ancestors had servants and, and they treated them as members of their household. Those were the strangers among us. That's the difference between us and, and them in terms of how they treated. We treated our servants as members of our household. They treated us as slaves, pieces of property. Another question comes to mind, does having a cross or crucifix qualify as breaking the second commandment? So do you guys know what the second commandment says? Let me open up my Bible on my phone. Second commandment, let's see. So the first commandment, you must not have any other gods but me. The second commandment, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or the earth or in the sea or on the earth or in the sea. Right? So Exodus 20, verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee, this is the 1611 King James Version, shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So on the surface of that, you might say, well, the crucifix was on earth, you know, and you don't know if it's in heaven, so you can't say that. And you don't know what's deep underneath the sea, what's, the, what's in the water under the earth. I don't think any man has actually gotten that deep. So on the surface, you, you can question it. But you need some context here because it's, it's actually not finished, there's more to it. So if you read the next couple of verses, it's a continuation and it says, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. So what is them? Those images that you made, those graven images. So you should not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you see, the cross is a historical item. It was known to be used in Roman executions of those times. So a graven image or a carved image of things that are on the earth or earthly things, I don't see anything wrong with it to the extent that you do not make them or elevate them to where you're worshiping that cross or you're making that cross your God. That would be a sin. That would be breaking a commandment. That's making an idol. Another question, what was the symbol the conversos were forced to wear on their hand and forehead? 
Now, this is going to be a little controversial. And again, you guys are going to have to go do some research for yourself. Now, the conversos are the when the Jews or the Israelites were kicked out of Spain and Portugal. Those who did stay and convert to Christianity were called conversos. They were forced to wear or bear a mark. So, some there was various uh, different variations of the mark. Sometimes it was the way they dressed was different. Um, sometimes they had to wear different types of shoes, um, different types of hats, a different colored belt. So that wasn't the only thing that they were forced to wear to identify themselves. It it was various depending on which European country you were dealing with and what time frame you were dealing with after Judaism was kind of outlawed, so to speak. So what was the symbol that the conversos were forced to wear on their hand and forehead? Does that symbol look familiar? I'm gonna paste a, this link of this in the description box. It's an article that talks about that so-called star of David. Forced to wear on their foreheads and their hand, their right hand. Hmm. That should spark something in your mind also. And please don't take this the, the wrong way. Like I said, this is just thinking out loud. You judge for yourself. You study for yourself. You come to your own conclusions. I am not telling you anything. I'm pointing you some information that you can use. The Bible says to study and show yourself approved. I can't take your test for you, but I can help you study. So isn't that where the mark of the beast is supposed to be also? On your forehead and your right hand? And that, that star David has six points, six sides, and six triangles. That should bother you also. You can call it a coincidence. But I don't believe there's coincidences. But study it for yourself. Like I said, I, I plan on putting that link in the description box for you to read more about it if you're interested. So one last reference I'm going to leave you guys with, and this is not a written reference. This is a story from, from my childhood. And I, I used, like any other uh, child, you know, I, I, have a, I have an older brother who used to pick on me and I have a younger brother and I used to pick on him. So as a child, you know, I used to pick on my little brother and if my father, you know, happened to be around at the time and he, he heard you messing with your little brother, picking on him, at some point he would say, hey, leave him alone, you big galoot. Never thought anything about it, but now as I'm older, I look up that word and the origin of that word is gonna kind of blow your mind a little bit, or at least it did for me. So I was like, what the heck is a galoot? Well, believe it or not, galoot is a Hebrew word. And you, and you know what it means? Like I said, I doubt my father knew he was, he was speaking Hebrew at the time. But galut in Hebrew means exile. So by default, he's actually saying, he's calling me an Israelite exile. And he didn't even know what he was calling me. And by default, he's calling himself an Israelite exile because he's my, my forefather. Look up that word. Galut, it is a Hebrew word meaning exile. 
All right, so that's what I got for you this this episode. Hopefully, you guys got something out of it. Like I said, this episode should have been first before the one before, but, you know, like I said, there is no mistakes or things work out for a reason. Our father is in control. He was not surprised by this, but hopefully this has edified you, caused you to do some reading on your own, caused you to go look into your Bible because that's what it's all about getting you to go read the Bible for yourself and recognize that we are the descendants of the biblical Hebrew Israelites. We are the people of the book. So guys, I appreciate your time. I thank you for watching. Happy Sabbath. And as always, worship the Father, praise the Son, and accept the Holy Spirit. Y'all be blessed. I love you guys. Peace.